coming up on Market to Market. With fanfare fit for a king, America's first commercial scale cellulosic ethanol plant opens for business. Responding to an epic drought, California lawmakers approve sweeping reforms on the use of groundwater. And we'll catch up with a trio of Kansas brothers whose video clips promoting agriculture have been viewed by millions. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, September 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. In what could be a dubious development for the economy, the government reported Friday that the U.S. labor market is cooling. According to the Labor Department, employers added just 142,000 positions to their payrolls in August. That's the smallest gain in eight months, and it snapped a six-month streak of hiring that exceeded 200,000. America's unemployment rate fell one-tenth of a point to 6.1 percent, but that was because more people without jobs stopped looking for work and therefore were no longer counted as unemployed. The biggest hiring declines occurred in the retail sector, which, after gaining 21,000 new workers in July, lost 8,400 jobs in August. Employment numbers were flat in the manufacturing industry, down from a gain of 28,000 positions in July, and hiring in the transportation and warehousing sector declined by 94 percent from the previous month. Renewable fuel producers often tout their ability to put America back to work. And this week, in a ceremony fit for a king, national and international dignitaries launched what they proclaimed is a key development in the journey to energy independence. Emmitsburg, Iowa was the site of a rock and roll show this week that rivaled those in major urban cities. But there weren't any entertainers. Instead, the performer taking the stage at this event was billed by its promoters as a renewable energy rock star. On Wednesday, Poet Advanced Biofuels and its partner, Royal DSM of the Netherlands, cut the ribbon on Project Liberty, America's first commercial-scale cellulosic ethanol plant. And Sivisma Royal DSM, which is joined with the great company Poet, is bringing that innovation here to Iowa, to Emmitsburg, and I'd like to congratulate Emmitsburg, Iowa, and the United States to have this premiere on their soil. King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands was joined by domestic dignitaries to unveil what some believe is the next big step on the road to American energy independence. Rather than using corn kernels as its primary feedstock, Project Liberty will glean harvest leftovers of corn cobs, stalks, and leaves. At full capacity, the operation will convert 770 tons of biomass per day to produce up to 25 million gallons of renewable biofuel annually. POET relied heavily on support from its Dutch partner and assistance from state and federal agencies to build the $275 million operation. The state of Iowa and the U.S. Departments of Energy and Agriculture pumped more than $120 million into the cutting-edge facility. I think it's critical that the government uh, stand behind, uh, you know, the policies that they have and, and show that they're not going to waver. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be difficult to get investors, bankers, and all the things we're going to need. While the ethanol industry has touted the potential of the cellulosic variety for years, producing the next generation of biofuels has proven to be more difficult than expected. And some naysayers doubted it was even possible on such a large scale. Now, I know that there are some skeptics out there who may be asking the question, is cellulosic ethanol for real? Can it be commercially produced? Well, I say come to Emmitsburg and see this extraordinary facility that's going to produce 25 million gallons. Learn about the fact that it's now part of a 14 billion gallon industry that is helping to drive down U.S. imports of foreign oil to record lows. 
Ethanol proponents also point to ethanol's proven ability to lower prices at the pump. Critics, however, blame the nation's dominant renewable fuel for everything from higher U.S. food prices to deforestation in developing countries. But while remembering that necessity is the mother of invention, a member of the Dutch delegation admonished those attending the event to seize the moment. The Stone Age didn't end it because we ran out of stones, but because we had a better technology, just better alternatives. It's no embellishment to say that California is an agricultural juggernaut. The Golden State produces nearly 70% of America's fruits, nuts, and vegetables. And the USDA estimates the value of its annual agricultural output at $44 billion. But persistent drought is rattling California's farm economy. And aftershocks could be felt in the form of higher food prices from sea to shining sea. With hydrological resources in extremely short supply, policymakers took steps this week to conserve the state's precious groundwater. As extreme drought continues its three-year chokehold on California, Sacramento lawmakers took steps late last week to regulate groundwater supplies for the first time in the state's history. Several bills aiming to overhaul the Golden State's long-standing pump-as-you-please water policy have made their way to the governor's desk. The proposals target groundwater basins in danger of being depleted faster than they can be replenished. Local governments would be required to develop groundwater management strategies and allow state authorities to intervene if necessary. While groundwater accounts for 60% of California's water use during drought years, regulation of the precious resource has paled in comparison to highly scrutinized reservoirs, rivers, and streams. It's all the way down, there ain't nothing there. California's agricultural industry is withering under the parched conditions. Fields have gone fallow and widespread unemployment has walloped farm workers in the state's normally bountiful Central Valley. Proponents argue that true water management in California will never be realized until groundwater is regulated. But opponents claim hastily drawn rules could compound the issue by limiting access to a crucial resource when people need it the most. I represent parts of my district where they have for the last two years received a 0% allocation of water. 0%. They've survived for the last several years by pumping the water from the ground. Now we know what they're doing is unsustainable. We recognize that. But when you're getting 0%, what else are we going to do? Two years ago, Market to Market introduced viewers to the Petersons, a trio of brothers from Kansas whose musical parodies have become an internet sensation. Since we first aired the story, the Peterson brothers have expanded their sphere of influence from a small community on the Southern Plains to a global stage. And what began as a whimsical video extolling the virtues of agriculture has exploded into a series of promotional clips viewed by 30 million times on YouTube. Paul Yeager explains. Deep in the heart of waving wheat, the Peterson family farm is a working soundstage. This 1,000 acre operation has served as a real life studio for the Peterson brothers breakout hit, I'm farming and I grow it. The video went viral and now has amassed 9 million views. It launched a farm music career of Greg, Nathan, and Kendall Peterson of Asaria, Kansas. It's just crazy to think about um, people are, for some reason, clicking on our video out there. The trio has taken a handful of pop hits and made them their own. Now this is a story all about how our life is spent wiping sweat off our brow. And we'd like to take a minute just to stop and say what goes down on the farm in a typical day. Working farmer style. Farmer style. Work, 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 work. Working farmer style. I am a farmer and they want to see me show. Oh, 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 oh. He turns sun farm bro. We back. All I do is farm, 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 no matter what. Market to Market first discovered the Petersons' agrotainment efforts in 2012. 
In the years since, a few things have changed. Greg is now a college graduate. Middle brother Nathan is a junior at K-State and is now joined by Kendall in Manhattan. The family farm still requires a full-time commitment, and the brothers say their lives have changed, but their values are still the same. We're still just normal people, uh, still working on a normal farm with everyday troubles and everyday good things. When I meet people, I just like to think, well, they're not too much different from me, and I'm not too much different from them, and uh, we're all working together to feed the world and, and just each do our jobs. So. Uh, it's just kind of cool how it all works together. We are the Peterson Farm Bros. Despite that humble attitude, the video clips have given the brothers other opportunities. I've always had an idea of the potential of what we're doing, um, but it continues to surprise me each and every day. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've gone and told our story to, to groups all over the country, and every time I tell the story, it, it still blows my mind, you know, just, talk, just, just reliving that, those first two weeks and the time since. At the time of the release of their first video, Greg was a senior studying ag communications at Kansas State University. At times, his classes would turn into discussions about, well, the Peterson brothers and how they took the everyday happenings in rural America and made them known around the world. The class would then hear how an idea conceived in a Manhattan, Kansas drive-in restaurant landed the family in the center of Manhattan, New York. The Petersons then became a hot commodity on the speaking circuit. Greg said he could fit some appearances around his studies, but eventually he would have requests to appear during classes. But when he explained his predicament to his instructors, they were supportive of his newfound stardom. And the professors would almost encourage it uh, just because of the positive things we were doing. And And the opportunities took Greg, and at times, the entire family all around the world. The family estimates it's done 75 events across 30 states in four foreign countries. The most recent trip was to Australia. The Petersons say they are trying to live normal lives, but the mission remains the same, raising awareness of agriculture's positive contributions to life in the information age. Do you consider yourself an advocate? Yeah, I think that's, I think by definition, that's, that's kind of my job. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on the farm. I'm basically, yeah, promoting what I, what I believe about agriculture and, and uh, just doing it in a fun and entertaining way. There's nothing to it. This video, however, by the restaurant chain Chipotle got the attention of Greg. He said the chain Scarecrow campaign aimed at changing the way people think about and eat fast food, made him mad because it distorted the reality of conventional farming. And when Chipotle later released a web TV series called Farmed and Dangerous, Greg submitted this statement to the Huffington Post. Quote, the truth is that they are attacking thousands of family farms across America, like ours, that fit the definition of an industrial farm. I was just frustrated with Chipotle and how they went about it. And I actually tweeted back and forth with their media, with their media public relations guy. And, and um, I don't know, they're, they're not interested in, in talking to farmers. They're interested in, in you know, promoting themselves and, and making people buy more of their stuff. It's not about farmers, it's, it's about uh, money. Despite his battle with a well-heeled restaurant chain, Greg says his job is far from over. One of my main goals in life is to is to correct um, mistruths, you know, false information. Whether it's about farming, uh, whether it's about you know, like my faith, uh, just anything I'm passionate about. If people are out there and and they're promoting things about it that aren't true, um, that that's what really sparks my my passion to to help correct that. And so um, I just I just want to be someone who stands for truth. And, uh, you know, you talk about Chipotle claiming that they want to have integrity. Well, that, that's kind of what I want to, to bring about is, is integrity. And I think, I think farmers have a lot of integrity. While Greg has turned the viral video into a successful career on the speaking circuit, he and younger brother Nathan are never totally removed from the farm. Farming is what we're used to, so you can kind of go back there and. And uh, even when I get tired of classes at school and stuff, I can still come home and 
work on the farm a couple days and you can come back here and just kind of relax. Agriculture is so important. As long as we can paint a positive uh, picture for agriculture uh, in whatever way that is, you know, maybe our videos will change a little here and there, but um, we have a platform and so we're trying to do our best with it. We pull out of the yard about seven or eight and we yell to the cattle, you'll see you smell you later. As far as the next couple years go, we're, we're hoping to continue to make videos and and uh, I think Nathan said it, as, as long as our videos stay quality and as long as we're having you know, fun making them, uh, we don't want to get to the point where it's, it's considered a chore to make these videos. They're just as fun for us to make as, as they are for people to watch. We still love the farm, farm, farm. And if you know the charm, put your hands in the air, make them stay there. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Informa Economics released its latest estimates on U.S. corn production late this week, calling for a harvest of 13.94 billion bushels. That was friendly to corn prices Friday, but not enough to counter losses in the previous sessions. For the week, December wheat lost 28 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 9 cents lower. Soybeans also declined as the November contract fell 3 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a loss of $5.80 per ton. In the softs, cotton gave back all of last week's gain and then some as the December contract shed $2.26 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, October Class 3 milk lost 18 cents, while the deferred contract gave up 54. But the big story again this week was in the livestock sector, where the October cattle contract gained $8.33, Nearby feeders advanced by $7.65, and the lean hog contract improved by $7.50. In the financials, the euro lost 18 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil gave up all of last week's move with a loss of $2.63 per barrel. Comex Gold declined by $20 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index traded sideways, settling at 6.11 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Let's jump right into the wheat pit this week. Bit of a sell-off. Talk to us about what happened. Well, you know, I think the wheat market is uh, shows us kind of where the direction of the corn and soybeans uh, are going to go. We had a, a big push to the upside on some concerns, and then uh, technically uh, there's just uh, there's too much wheat in the world market. So what happens is when December wheat gets up around the uh, 575, 580 level, it's too expensive in the world market. And now we pulled back close to, we're uh, 535. As you get close to this 520, 25 area, you're back down to value and we're pretty competitive in the world market. So we're caught in this range and it's really about uh, a big world supply, a glut if you will, and uh, you have to be uh, very price conscious when you're uh, in the wheat market. Now a range like this open up some trading opportunities for producers. How long could we expect to stay in this range? Well, we've been in a, a range since July 24th. We really haven't uh, moved out of this range of about uh, 50, 60 cents. Um, and I think what you have to really look at is we're probably going to stay in this range. No reason really to fall, uh, you know, big to the downside. On the other side, until we're threatened in the world market, there's uh, no reason to tie, take out the top end of the range. So, and, and that's very char characteristics of a, a supply bear market. Okay. Well, let's jump over to the corn market. We had a volatile week, to say the least, in corn down 14 on Wednesday and, and up close to 10 today in the December corn contract. Are we being driven by weather fears as we get closer to harvest? Well, what we're really at is, you know, when you look at the corn market, it's uh, counter-seasonally, the crop ratings are staying high and actually improved last week 1%. So what we really have is a market that uh, the crop's getting bigger, not smaller. And before you can change the direction of a market like this, you have to send a signal to the market that we need to change directions. And so far, when you look at the yields that we're getting out of the uh, south and the uh, delta, they're uh, huge. And so if that continues to drive, uh, the, if we have the same yield results as we new, move north, uh, you would have to say that there probably is downside, but limited downside uh, potential. I think you really have to ask yourself, have we put the harvest low in before we start harvest, Mike? You know, it's, uh, uh, it would be a big surprise. If the yields are lower, we will. If we get into an early frost, we will. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now, big crops are getting bigger. 
That's right. And now should we have a little bit of confidence from the producer's perspective that we closed below our recent trading range and, and down there in those uh, 340s mm -hmm. and then bounced right back up above at the next day? Does that, and is that an indication of any strength going forward? Well, what we did is we broke through a trading range that we had from this 360 to 380 level. When we broke through 358, we pounded the December market down to that 340, uh, five and three quarters area. Um, we did get a technical rally back, but it was really back to just uh, some resistance. If we close the Deese corn over 363, you know, you could have a push back up to 370 quickly to 375. But in a supply bear market, I think uh, rallies are meant to be sold. That'd be a 30 cent rally. And uh, harvest is going to continue to uh, gain momentum as we move forward. So it's uh, uh, there again, it's a supply bear market. All right, well, let's jump into the soybean pit. Uh, relatively unchanged on the week. For soybeans, are we just biding our time to see what comes off the combine at this point? Well, I think when you look at the, the market, what we've really done, we've just slashed a lot of these markets to the downside. And we're really on hold to see once what the yield uh, looks like. The downside uh, momentum is, uh, has, has stalled. You know, there's really not a huge uh, downside push. A lot of the uh, uh, big losses are uh, out of the market. The pulse is still there, uh, barely on the soybean market. We could get an early frost here, you know, next week, the week after, that'd give us some support. But, you know, without that, it looks like the yields continue to be huge down in the Delta in the uh, southern Midwest. So uh, the downside objective was $10 on corn. We bounced off of that. 9.85 is a gap objective from the uh, July gap lower. If we'd happen to get over uh, 1029 uh, early next week, you could push up to the 1050 to 1060, but that's going to be uh, a very hard uh, resistance area unless we get some uh, changes in the fundamentals, some kind of a game changer. So really that 1029, that 1030 level would be a, a, probably an opportunity to make some sales. Yeah, it's not that far up, but I think uh, that's probably the next upside objective. And, you know, that's almost a 30 cent bounce off the bottom again. You bet. Well, now let's jump over uh, to the livestock markets. Uh, we saw fat cattle rally again this week. We seem to have shaken off all the fears that were raised when Russia made their announcement about uh, restricting imports from the West. Is this strength real? Do, do we anticipate it to continue? Well, the cattle market and the feeder cattle market is one of the few commodities that we actually do have a bull market in. But the real question mark is how high is high. And, uh, you know, when you have the, uh, the cattle market up at these lofty levels with competing meats coming at you, uh, I think you have to be very leery. You can see how uh, volatile this market is. December cattle moved from uh, 147.50 just, you know, a few, uh, you know, few days ago, really, up to this close to this 161. So that's a tough resistance across the board on cattle. From risk management standpoint, you owe it to yourself to put some kind of windows on the market because you know it's all about the competing meats. Uh, poultry uh, next uh, year is gonna be up 2.6%. Pork's expected to be up 1%. Beef down 1%. That's not that big of a drop on beef. So that's where we're really sitting. So now for producers looking at, again, we're back to these lofty prices. Folks may have thought they were gone here two weeks ago when the market fell apart. If they were unhedged, maybe now might be a good time to get some protection. Would you be looking at an options play this time as opposed to a straight futures? Well, you can, do, you can do both. I think it's on your risk management side, but if you want a hard sell and you think there's upside potential, you can sell the futures and then buy uh, insurance going up. Otherwise, these window contracts where you buy, uh, you know, some insurance right at the money with a cap, you know, $8 up, you know, that's a lofty number, is not a bad way to go. And, and you feel comfortable at these price levels. Remember the BSE uh, days that we had? It's the unknown that's really going to hurt you in the cattle business, not the uh, knowns. And it's pretty much an all-in in the cattle market. Very few people don't realize that we're not in a bull market. All right. Now, speaking of bull markets, feeder cattle up $15 in the last two weeks. And here we're, we're basically supply driven and we're heading into the fall. Do we expect the feeder price price to fall as, as some producers move calves to market here over the next uh, two months? Yeah, you know, and, and that's a good question. A lot of the feeder cattle, uh, you know, have been driven by uh, a number of things, but the, the lower input cost certainly uh, is a big driver. Uh, and, uh, you know, the cattle price bouncing back has given us some push to the upside. But I tell you, cattle, when you're looking at the feeder cattle up around 125 plus, 
those numbers uh, that are hard to sustain. We haven't been up here before. Really all we did is on the feeder cattle. We pulled all the way back, you know, with some of the scares we had. We make some, made some new highs on some of the months, but we're back up into some double top areas. Uh, next week will probably be key whether we can keep this momentum uh, going because we had a big uh, push on the cash cattle. Could have been a blow off top again on cash cattle. Okay. Now as we look at the mix at the slaughter rate, are we still retaining heifers? Does it look like this herd is going to grow next year? We are retaining heifers, and that's the one thing that is happening. And that is, that's the final phase of a bull market is when you start to uh, hold back, retain some heifers. Um, the same thing with the, uh, the cow slaughter's been down. Those are both signs, and that's what that's been the signal of the market. And it's just we've had droughts in different areas that's held this off. Uh, high price grain. Now we're here. Good grass conditions in a lot of areas. I know not in California, but in a lot of other other areas, the grass conditions have really improved. Well, now let's look over at the hogs climbing again for the last two weeks. Is this strength projected to continue? Well, the hog market is really is one that people are really having a hard time getting a handle on the numbers. Um, and I think what you have to look at, we think actually for the long pole we're in a supply bear market, unless we have issues with the PED virus. You know, we've had some outbreaks again this last uh, week in some big uh, areas, which makes you uh, concerned. But overall, our, uh, uh, there again, like cattle, we have some uh, uh, expansion going on. Our uh, sow slaughter's been down 4.2% so far this year, 8% the last two weeks. So um, if we get the PED virus under control, those back months are gonna really struggle. It's all about the lower slaughter that we've had the last two weeks has been giving us a push to the upside. All right. Well, Don, thank you for taking the time to be with us this week. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Don and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine Midwestern efforts to revitalize a team of agricultural workers whose productivity is unrivaled. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.